screen here. Let's see if that worked. That looks like it worked. Okay, great. Um, there we go. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, that welcome, uh, uh, Thomas. And um, I'm very honored to be here um, remotely. I'm sitting in the uh, relative warmth of Farmville, Virginia, uh, although it's cold everywhere. I'm actually going to be in Charlotte uh, on Saturday, so uh, I'll be down there presenting and looking forward to that. It's always a fun, fun trip, fun gig. Um, this, uh, this evening, I'd like to talk about Azure DevOps and the SSIS development lifecycle. And um, I have more slides in this presentation than I normally do. Probably, it's probably close to maybe 10 times as many slides. I'm not a big PowerPoint person. But um, a little bit about me. Um, there's a link I'll repeat at the end of this, andyleonard.blog slash learn dash more. And um, there's some notes about me in there. Um, I'll be talking about some of these as I go on. Uh, Datadriven.tv is a podcast I've been doing with Frank Lavinia for over two years. I think we're coming up on three years now. We just hit 100,000 downloads. Crazy. Which that's like 99,000 more downloads than I thought we'd get. Um, <laughs> so it's all because of Frank. He's awesome. But i um, also very honored to be a re-awarded MVP um, in March of this year. I was an MVP from uh, 2007 to 2012. Um, back then, they called us SQL Server MVPs. Now, they call us Data Platform. So, lots of, uh, <coughs> of interesting stuff out there. A um, couple of notifications. Things, are, uh, things change, especially in the cloud. And um, as a result, I, I can guarantee you I'm going to see stuff during this presentation that I'm seeing for the first time. In fact, right before this presentation, I fired up um, you know, some stuff in uh, Azure and uh, I was seeing new and different things. So the, the cloud is constantly changing. If, if this is the first time you've heard that, then at least you've heard it. But it literally changes every day, Azure especially. So that was our introduction. Um, I want to talk about a brief history of Azure DevOps, and um, then we're going to look at agents, and then we're going to look at pipelines. And this is a fairly um, intense presentation. I, I think I, I underplayed it when I set the session level uh, the first time I delivered it. I would say this is in the, uh, it, it spans the gamut. <laughs> you know, it, it definitely works from uh, from introductory uh, up to advanced, especially when you're trying to do something like CI, CD with uh, SSIS. And we're going to start with that and then talk more about source control. <laughs> I've been thinking about this for at least 12 years. Um, my first uh, past summit presentation was delivered in Denver back in 2007. This is a screenshot of one of the slides. I've, I've gotten a little better at slides since then. But um, yeah, 12 years at least I've been talking about this. Uh, to do this presentation with Team Foundation Server, not this exact presentation, but to do a presentation, I was running TFS beta, Team Foundation Server beta, on one laptop and presenting on another. I even brought a router with me to Denver so I could set all this up to, to a talk. I've also written a book about um, about this called um, – uh, it's 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 uh, hang on just a second I keep, i'm hearing an echo and i know why i'm turned up too loud there we go so <clears throat> i brought um I, I wrote about this i wrote a book called data integration Lifecycle management with ssis um <clears throat> this is uh on the books i know pun intended to be um to be uh, updated um as we uh you know as we move into 2020 and uh, one of the things that, that's in this book, talking about continuous integration, that's what the CI stands for, uh, where you merge software frequently. Continuous delivery is where you deploy software frequently. Um, a, a thing that I said said years ago was that SSIS is software development. So I, I want to, you know, emphasize that, that when we're talking about all of these these developer technology, software development best practices, and we're talking about SSIS, there's a really good reason for that, and, and that's it, SSIS software development. So, you know, as we do this, uh, the application, I'm going to do some walkthroughs here, which is going to be a lot of screenshots. I can guarantee you uh, some of them are going to be out of date because I put this together 
uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, about six weeks ago, but everything changes in uh, Azure. But uh, as we walk, as we do these walkthroughs, I'm going to show you how to connect to Azure DevOps, um, how to set up your very first Azure DevOps project, how to then configure Visual Studio to interact with um, with Azure DevOps, and then add a solution to Source Control. And again, these are just walkthroughs where I um, I show you how to you know get to Azure DevOps. If you want to play along, um, I've got some some code that I use for um, for basic testing especially in demos, and you can grab the code that I'm going to be using for this sample by going to entdna.com. That's, that's my consulting company, Enterprise Data and Analytics. Uh, entdna.com slash SSIS samples. And that'll take you to this um, public project in Azure DevOps, and you can uh, clone the code. You can download the zip. Um, when you go to sign up for Azure DevOps, you want to go to dev.azure.com. And as I said, this screen is most likely already out of date, but uh, there will be a start free button there and there will be um, information about what is free and what's not. Uh, they do a very good job of up front telling you what you would need to pay for and, and what you will not. Once you've done that, they're going to ask you to create an organization. I didn't walk through all of that, but my organization is called ENTDNA. And when we click uh, the new project button, there'll be a couple of places where you can click that button. When you do that, it um, it puts you into a blade. Uh, these little slide out blades that come out of the side of the browser there. The create new project blade uh, hasn't changed since I uh, last looked at it. And I, this is when I created SSI samples. This is what it looked like. Um, I made mine public. Uh, and, and just so you know, you can create... Um, at the last time I looked at it, which was gosh, a couple of weeks ago, you could create unlimited private um, projects for free. You can sign up for free and uh, create unlimited private projects. And you can have, um, I think it's a total of five team members. So you and four others um, can have access to this project. You can, you can build a team. Maybe it's a distributed team all over. And uh, you can work for free. Um, in here, you can actually use uh, all of you use the uh, source control in here um, for this particular project. I just want to point out here on the screen, get my mouse over there. I'm using Team Foundation server or Team Foundation version control. And a lot of people these days when they talk about version control are talking about Git. <clears throat> I totally understand uh, why uh, Git's awesome. It's uh, built for distributed transaction control. So why would I build um, this presentation talking about uh, Team Foundation? <clears throat> well, um, the, the, the reason is um, not everybody is, um, you know, is using Git. <clears throat> so as, as I move through here and talk about the, uh, you know, this, this is what the project looks like after I've created it in Team Foundation server, but I get this question so much, I, I added the slide. Um, not everybody's using Git. There's a lot of companies out there that have an investment in Team Foundation Server. And one of the things I'm trying to share is um, not just what works today and the new shiny, and some of this is very new and shiny. Um, a lot of people aren't realize, or do not realize that they can, um, they can move from an on-premises Team Foundation Server, which has been rebranded Azure DevOps Server, uh, to the cloud, and they can continue to use their old uh, Team Foundation server, um, you know, artifacts, workflows, that sort of stuff. It's still available there. And the reason that I, I want to share that is, you know, you can decide to start using Git from now on um, in Azure DevOps uh, in the cloud. <laughs> um, but if you're still using Team Foundation, um, uh, artifacts there, you can continue to, um, you know, where you can, you can pick that up and move that right to the cloud and continue working as you always have been. Not everybody can, you know, turn on a dime and 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 move to say a different um, source control or version control engine. So I just want to make sure you you know folks are aware that that's uh, viable and available and it works. Um, the next step that you need to do um, <clears throat> is to configure Visual Studio. And here I'm using Visual Studio 2017. Um, I'm doing that because I'm almost positive that the integration services um, 
uh, extension for 2019, although Visual Studio 2019 is available. I'm not sure that the um, the integration services extension is um, uh, is is at general availability. I think it's still in preview. Not positive of that. Um, haven't looked in a few days, and as we all know, things change pretty rapidly. But if you open Visual Studio, uh, either one, 2019 or 2017, this this configuration piece hasn't changed. Um, you go to source control, and then you choose which uh, engine you're going to use. Because I'm going to connect to a Visual Studio Team Foundation server, um, you know, version control in Azure DevOps. I'm going to set this up for TFS, and um, once that that piece is done. Um, now I have to connect to it. So under team, I go to uh, manage connections and that brings up team explorer, uh, which has been around for a while uh, for interacting with um, all sorts of source control in visual studio. <laughs> I click uh, manage connections and then connect to a project. Um, I sign in uh, to, um, to my account there at, uh, at uh, Azure DevOps. And then I browse to my, uh, my project and go ahead and connect. Um, once I'm connected, <clears throat> excuse me, I can see, uh, you know, I get um, the ability to look at the work, pending changes, source control, explore. There's a bunch of tiles there on that screen that allow me to now interact with, uh, with my project. And, uh, you know, I have, I have now a, um, an SSIS solution. In fact, I pulled it down from that SSIS samples. Um, to work with. It's called Test SSIS Solution because I use it for testing SSIS and I was feeling really creative when I built that. Um, <clears throat> there's a project in the solution called Test SSIS Project. <clears throat> Pardon me. And there are uh, three packages in there. Um, when I first built this locally, it looked in Solution Explorer like this. I had not yet added it to uh, my Azure DevOps project. But that's not hard to do. You right click on the solution and you can just click the uh, the add solution to source control. When you click that, of course, it asks you, where do you want to put it? And in this case, I, I told it, go ahead and drop it into this test SSIS solution inside of my um, SSIS samples team foundation server project. And when I did that, that's it, it then gives you these little green pluses here. Um, uh, and so you can see these little green plus marks uh, set beside the um, in your options here. And that means that it's added, but it hasn't yet been uh, checked in, at least for the first time or committed. So let's see, I think I skipped a slide there. Oh, yeah. So when you right click and you click check in, I put the wrong uh, menu there. <laughs> That's what it is. I wanted to right click and show you the check in menu. Sorry about that. Duplicate slide. Um, when you right click the solution and it's got those little green pluses there, an option exists to check in the code. So when you click check in, you can then, um, uh, you know, in Team Explorer, you get to the pending uh, changes page here. And it's a good idea to include a comment. And you can see here the, um, the comment that I did. We're recording this and talking about this on the 4th of December 2019. Um, just about six weeks ago is when I was working through this particular demo. <laughs> And, and I put it in as the initial check-in there. So it hasn't been that long. Um, once it is checked in, you get another icon that is uh, available here. And it it, it symbolizes the, the artifacts that are checked in by putting these little um, Azure colored uh, locks. So there, there they are. And everything has been checked in. And that's my initial check-in. Once that's done, um, we can actually go over to the repo and, and look at this. Um, Let's pop over to my VM here. I want to make sure. Hope you can see um, a uh, Azure DevOps here. I'm going to uh, try to zoom it, and uh, hopefully you're able to see that. Are you? Okay. So here is that um, that test SSIS solution. So th of course this is Azure DevOps, the SSIS samples project, and under repos, um, short for repositories. There's my solution. Um, and that, that's the actual solution file there, the uh, test SSIS project folder. And I also included an IS pack folder here for um, for one version of this, just so if you were after this, um, you could pop in there and get to the IS pack for the uh, project. 
Uh, the, in fact, the reason that I did that is I'm, I'm friends with Aaron Nelson. I don't know if you know who he is. He works for Microsoft. Um, he's a big PowerShell guy, and and we work together quite a bit in this in this year, just um, working with PowerShell and SSIS. And he wanted to be able to deploy a project using PowerShell, so he wanted to do it from Azure DevOps. So I created that for like the IS package all in there. But this, these are the artifacts. This is, um, you know, what it looks like inside of um, the repo for the test SSIS uh, project and solution inside of SSIS sample. So, <clears throat> let's see, Move, moving forward here, let's talk some about agents. And I, um, I've actually got an agent running over here. I'm going to stop it and restart it when we get to it. But the agents are used to uh, to perform activities inside of Azure DevOps. So they do things like like do builds or copy files or deploy. Um, and, and you know, part of the stuff that we run into when we start doing any kind of work with um, with with any kind of um, a, you know of, of DevOps process lifecycle management, um, we run into problem when we're doing that related to data. And I, I'm pretty sure the reason why is that um, these processes were developed for uh, stateless code, like the JavaScript and Node and C Sharp. Developers. Um, all of these systems were built for folks doing that kind of work. And a database or data, by definition, is, is very stateful. And you see this when you start talking about things like you know doing builds and deployments, and especially when you start talking about doing rollbacks. Um, so let's say you add a column to a customer's table, and you know deploy it, and it's out there running. And there's a whole bunch of other things. Maybe there's Node and JavaScript and what? Sorry, well, not Windows, but web stuff out there, and it runs for a week. Somebody realizes it's doing something, and the decision's made to roll it back. But in the meantime, you know, you know, you've collected hundreds, maybe thousands of information from customers and include that new field you've added on the data side. So when you roll it back, what do you do? What do you do with that, what do you do with that column? And the answer is always it depends when it comes to data, especially in a post-GDPR age. Uh, we're starting in the U.S. now to get a lot of uh, privacy legislation being looked at uh, on state levels at least. Um, uh, the uh, federal government has been detracted, so they haven't been looking at this legislation. All they put out was a paper this year. A little disappointing, but uh, California, New York, and a handful of other states are in various stages of actively looking at privacy uh, legislation. So you've got something that falls under GDPR and uh, can be personally, personal identification. And it's not just GDPR, there's HIPAA. Uh, there's PII, there's a whole slew of standards out there. And if you're pulling that kind of information down, what do you do when you do a rollback? And the answer is always it depends. So this is part of what we run into when we start talking about agents and some of the things agents can do because they can perform things like, like rollbacks. In, in this one, I'm just going to walk through the configurations and I've listed the steps there. <clears throat> I'm going to use a self-hosted Windows agent. Uh, the reason is my VM is a uh, is a Windows VM, and the other reason is um, another good reason for this is I found that these self-hosted agents perform way better than using um, agents in the cloud, and you can pick both when you configure them. But as you go through a configuration, you're going to see you need to create a personal access token. Uh, this happens in um, up in Azure DevOps, <coughs> and you. Um, you just click on personal access, access tokens. You actually hit this uh, this icon up here first, this configuration icon, then personal access tokens. When you click that, then a new token becomes available and you click that. And then you get a blade to uh, set up a, a uh, personal access token. Um, I tried this a couple different ways and I found using the default agent pool is a better way to go. So I did that. <clears throat> and of course, this is going to, um, this particular one expires um, shortly. In fact, I'm going to have to set up another one. I, I was just looking at the dates here and seeing that um, uh, this particular personal access token is going to expire probably in about a month. 
and you configure it um, as shown uh, here. And by the way, these uh, slides are available. I can I don't, I don't mind sending them to you, so you can walk through this. Again, the caveat is things are going to change and move, but if you follow, um, there's some links in here, and if you follow those links, it'll take you right through the process, even when it's updated. Uh, it'll take you through with updated um, uh, process settings. <clears throat> Inside of my organization, I have to go to my organizational settings here in Azure DevOps and then to Agent Pools. And inside of Agent Pools, I have to click on my uh, my default after I've created my personal access token. And I, I then need to create a new agent. And, and when I do that, it gives me this really cool um, first, I have to download the agent, and it, it takes care of downloading it, and it walks me through some PowerShell to unzip it, and it puts this agent in a directory on a C drive. It makes a new directory called agent. I, I'm as excited about that as you are, um, but <clears throat> it does work, and when you run the config command statement here, it actually walks you through and prompts you um, uh, with some for some information, and then after you get it configured, uh, you can run it. And this is what it looked like on my machine. I actually went uh, to a, a, a command prompt and started PowerShell, and I just ran that um, dot config command, and it started asking me questions like, "What's the uh, server URL for your, um, you know, organization in Azure DevOps?" And it's uh, always going to be HTTPS uh, dev dot Azure dot com slash whatever your organization name is, and it's kind of like a little interview here when it's doing the configuration. It walks you through a number of questions here. Um, these were the answers that I supplied. And you can see the uh, authentication type is uh, that PAT, that's personal um, access token. And um, I said that wrong, but the token, uh, yeah, personal access token. And you paste that here. And then it, uh, it goes through registering it and asks you a couple more questions. And once it's done, uh, again, on, on your local machine, your laptop, or in my case, a VM here, you can actually um, run it. And once it starts running, you'll see that message listening for jobs. And um, mine is doing that right now. Um, if I go over here um, to the agent, let's get some of this stuff out of the way. And, yep, too many windows open. Um, <laughs> but there, it's um, it's actually running. And the way that you can stop it, the way I stop it, is to hit Control-C. Um, and it'll ask me, do you want to terminate the job? I'll say yes. I actually had to hit Control-C a couple of times. But if I go back up to a, a, a prompt here and just type in run to start the run command, um, it's, it starts checking. And if it had enough time to shut down properly, this will work. And it did. It takes a few seconds for it to shut down and clean up. If you try to just stop it and restart it immediately after, sometimes uh, you'll get an error here. It'll say, um, I forget exactly what the error message is, but it's letting you know that for what there's a reason why it can't start running. It won't be listening for jobs like it is here. But this agent is, is kind of cool. What this is doing is this is running a, a piece of software, um, a listener, if you will, and this listener is on a VM on my laptop in Farmville, Virginia, and it's connected to some server somewhere in the Azure DevOps space, and it's listening for some job to start. So I, f I just find this fascinating. Um, I, I love this, uh, this interaction with the cloud. Um, <clears throat> this is where it starts to get interesting and um, a little new. So when we start talking about pipelines, um, when we configure a pipeline, you know, we start by by building a new build pipeline. Um, and I, I just want to say here, if you're experienced with Azure DevOps, this is a very basic example. There's a number of reasons why, but part of it is these last uh, couple of items here, these two last two bullets. Um, the build SSIS task and deploy SSIS task um, have not yet been released to general availability. They are in private preview. And if you're listening to this um, and you want to, to get in on the fun, um, drop me an email. I'll share my email address at the end. And I'll put you in contact with the uh, Azure SSIS team. They're uh, responsible for these new tasks in Azure DevOps. And they're letting people you know, jump right in, as many people who want to come, up, come in and play. But that's one of the reasons why I kept the pipeline relatively simple. Um, 
I didn't get, you know, way complex crazy with it, but you're going to see quite a bit of power in using these uh, new Azure DevOps tasks here built specifically for SSIS. Now, we'll say prior to this, yes, you could do um, what the build and deploy tasks do, but you were kind of rolling your own. Um, you, you know, and if you knew how to build something that could plug right into Azure DevOps and it's possible to add um, you know, add tasks and uh, in the marketplace that others can go and and you know and use. Um, this is built by by the people on the team, so they're um, they've got access to more code than we do. Um, and and this is I, I think as a result of that, this is a lot better. Um, I've used some of the stuff others have put out there, and some of it works and some of it doesn't. And part part of the reason is things changed and they're not being maintained. This is Microsoft stuff. So when we start with pipelines, and we'll sh I'll show you this in the demo, <clears throat> I've got some pipelines built. Um, we, you know, you start by clicking on pipelines and then clicking new and then uh, build a, you know, a new build pipeline. And once you do that, uh, the process, uh, it, you know, you pick your source control. It wants to know where your uh, code is. So how is it going to find this code to do the build? And in my case, it's Team Foundation version control. Um, and again, it asked me selecting a source. T TFVC is Team Foundation Version Control. And then I, um, I give it the server path um, and any subpaths that I may have in here. And I decided to start um, not with a template, but with an empty job. I wanted to show you um, all of the pieces and parts to, uh, to build in one. And, you know, one of the things it asked me uh, early on is it wants to know, what, uh, you know, how am I going to uh, run this? What is my agent pool? <clears throat> Pardon me there. And uh, I'm using the default. This is my local agent that I just started in the last demo. Um, and, and my next uh, step is to uh, configure these variables. And a var one of the variables I really want to be careful about is I've got a password here. I want to make sure that uh, that variable is created and it's masked. Uh, so I did. I created PWD VAR. Um, there is a system.debug uh, variable. Um, if, when I first started doing this, you, I believe you had to add it. I think it just shows up now, but I'm not positive of that. Um, that That is uh, handy, uh, but it's going to slow things down a lot because it's going to give you messages from every single step that the pipeline um, executes as it's walking through its process of building this uh, SSIS project. Um, and deploying it and whatever else you configure it to do, you can, you're kind of at, um, uh, you know, at your own, you're your own limit, however long it takes you to figure something out or however, however you can, if you can figure it out, you can get Azure DevOps to do it. Um, I just, uh, I named my, uh, my agent here. Um, I forget what I called my agent. I, you'll see it on the uh, jobs here. I've got four uh, configured before we're done. And, <clears throat> Uh, you know, as I as you build this job out, one of the things you can do, and you'll we'll see this when we get into the editor, is you can then add um, tasks to it. And I searched for SSIS, and it found SSIS build and SSIS deploy. And um, this is the person that registered them in Azure DevOps, so that's how they got here. These are again not generally available, but if we get you in contact with the team, you can get those added to your organization in Azure DevOps, and then they will be available. Um, this is more of a kind of a broader view of the um, of the demo here. Oh, sorry, of the of a um, one I built for for presenting at the past summit. And this is a you know a build agent. I have um, a display name over here. You'll notice the task version is zero dot. That's kind of a clue. It's not one yet. Not generally available project path, um, the output path. And if you're brand new to Azure DevOps, some of this is going to look a little intimidating, like these variables and the syntax uh, that's used inside of um, Azure DevOps. Um, a lot of this comes from Team Foundation Server um, because uh, Azure DevOps came from there. It kind of grew out of it. Um, Next, I add my uh, the new deploy task, deploy SSIS, and the blade to configure it is a uh, is a lot more intense, and it's using a lot more of these um, kind of a combination of of um, 
these Azure DevOps variables, kind of internal variables and paths. And it's it's building it. You know, it's going to build this out. Um, it's going to send it to a destination server. I have a server called svademo.database.windows.net. That is an SSI. There's an SSI catalog there, and it wants the path to that. And I've got a um, a, a folder in the SSISDB um, catalog. Uh, there's a folder named Pass Summit 2019 that I'm targeting for this. Uh, put my username in there, and that's why I mask my password. I've uh, created it as a variable, so I don't have to type that in. <clears throat> I can uh, overwrite and uh, decide what to do if an error occurs. Part of it, by the way, this this is very, uh, to, in my pipeline, uh, continue if a deployment error occurs. Setting that to no is very important to, um, to the flow of my pipeline, and that'll make a little more sense later. Um, and once I've got all of that set up, I can then execute a build. And back over on my VM... And let's pop this open here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So if I go to pipelines and I want to do a search for um, anything beginning with a zero, there's my uh, there's my pipeline called uh, zero deploy to test. And if we go edit this, you can see everything that I showed you. In fact, the screenshots uh, came from this before I renamed it. And if we zoom in here, you can see that um this is the name of my agent. It's called deploy to test. And I can add new artifacts. And the way I got build and deploy in here was I clicked this plus and the blades uh, showed over here. This is um, these are art or utilities and build steps and a whole bunch of stuff available in the marketplace, the Azure DevOps marketplace. And if I type SSIS, as I did on a the slide, there's build and deploy. There's some others out here. Um, this is not the same one, but you could just uh, click add and and create one over there. Uh, that's one way to do it. Once you get it over here, um, now you need to configure it. And I'm going to check to see if there's a new task version. So there's not. We're still at zero. Um, I named this build SSIS, uh, configured it to that project property path. And really, the only other thing I had to do was this output path. Um, for deploy... It, it gets it's a little more uh, verbose. I have to pick the um, the type of deployment I'm going to do. Note that you have an option. You can go to a catalog, which is SSISDB or a file system. And a lot of people don't realize this, but um, Azure Data Factory um, supports uh, executing DTSX files from file shares in Azure Blob Storage. Uh, that happened at the very end of June, June 30th, that went live. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, if you were gonna run an SSIS package uh, in the cloud uh, through ADF and, and platform as a service, you could always build a VM. But prior to that, the, your only option was deploying it to a catalog in the cloud. It turns out a lot of enterprises are still running um, SSIS from the file system. so. Microsoft is, is striving to um, remove barriers to enterprises wishing to migrate to the cloud. So if you want to pick up um, a folder locally and uh, deploy it to a file share uh, in Azure Blob Storage, uh, you can use the Azure Data Factory execute SSIS package activity to, um, to execute packages in Blob Storage now. And it's only, like I said, only been a few months that's been true. Um, I'm going to um, to a catalog, so I'm going to go to SSISDB. It wants my destination server, and there it is, and it wants my folder, um, you know, catalog folder path. There it is, and I'm doing SQL Server authentication, um, and there's my uh, username and my password and the rest of the configurations for it. So what I can do is um, one of the things I can do at this point from this menu is I can queue the job. And um, since I've got that running, when I click Q, it asks me which agent pool do I want to use, and I've got my local agent running. I can pick a, you know, a source version and a shelf set name. Um, I can reset my variables here if I'd like. The only one that I've really got in here is that system debug, and I want to leave it set at false. I can choose to enable system diagnostics, but I don't want to see those. I just want to go ahead and run it. And when I do, I want to show you the listener here, the agent, it's supposed to be listing for these jobs. And if you just saw that new line, 
<clears throat> um, it's running the job called deploy to test. So um, it's actually uh, doing that piece. And what does that look like when it does the uh, deploy to test? Pretty cool. It's uh, stepping through this code here, and you can see, I actually love these little windows uh, that we get, little command windows here, and it's walking through the steps that I configured, build, deploy, um, and it does a couple of other steps uh, before and after, uh, post-job checkout, and it tells me it succeeded. Now, <clears throat> what I failed to share with you before this was that there were, um, let's refresh the catalog uh, on there. there, there wasn't a, a project there, but it is now. And if I uh, just to verify, there is no project here uh, in the catalog in the cloud. This is the SVA demo, um, but it just did that deployment. Um, I believe I can prove it by right clicking and going to versions. And there's a timestamp on that as well. So if I, I look at this, um, we are looking at at 12.5 and this is UTC 12.36. And yep, that was just a few seconds ago. So um, that's as close as I can get to proving it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some utilities I built. Um, I just the I, I like the um, the integration services catalogs node in here up to a point, but I built a um, I built a different node. In fact, this had been refreshed before I started. <clears throat> this is a catalog browser, and it's available from um, dilmsuite.com. <coughs> um, uh, right here, and it's free. So um, it presents what I call a, um, a unified surface. Sorry about that. I'm going to have to stop and drink some water here in a minute. <laughs> but the, um, the idea behind this is to not have to open a bunch of windows. And if you've done, uh, if you use environments and literals, uh, references, reference mappings, environment variables. If you use any of that stuff, you know you got to open a bunch of windows uh, in the node in SSMS. Um, this just, um, it, it has everything that I need right here. In fact, um, there's a package connection with, uh, and it, it, it shows me all the information that I need um, right here. There's a package parameter in there as well. I don't have to dig into this. I can see things inside of the package and it's deployed to the catalog. I kind of like it, um, the, uh, but I'm, I'm biased. I wrote it, but that just got deployed. Um, and uh, again, this production folder, we're going to go there in a minute, but we're not there yet. I just wanted to make sure you know that's uh, that's not showing up in either of these. Um, so uh, with that, that's kind of the, uh, that's a manual execution of the build. And, you know, that's a, uh, that's kind of cool, but one of my dreams from way back is to be able to do what those Node developers and JavaScript developers and um, you know web devs and uh, C sharp developers. I wanted to be able to to check in the code, and when it gets checked in, I wanted to automatically do a build and a deploy and a test to maybe a test environment, and and then if that succeeds then I want to go ahead and do the continuous integration piece and go on and deploy it to production and maybe even do a, um, uh, a quick uh, test out there, run it in production just to make sure it works. And it's for my SSIS. And I've learned you can do that um, in here. And again, you could do this before it was just harder. So when I talk about testing, I'm going to use another thing that I wrote Dec uh, decade, a decade ago. I actually started on, I was going to say decades, but I'm not there yet. It's been about 17 years or so. I started writing frameworks for DTS. And um, so that the packages, uh, DTS packages could, if you dropped it onto a server, it could find its source and destinations. Uh, it's pretty cool. And that kind of started me into frameworks. I've got a free SSIS framework out there. Um, it's also available from, um, uh, yeah, from uh, from DILM Suite, and it's not only free; it's also open source. It's this one, SSI Framework Community Edition. So you can go grab the code out of a Git uh, repository, a public one, and and pull it down. Um, I'm also I've got catalog reports here. Uh, this is a reporting solution that I built in um, in SSRS 2014. Actually, I built it in 2012, but I ported it to 2014. Also free, also open source at DILM Suite. 
Um, the reason I like this is if you've ever used the built-in rep uh, reports inside of, um, say, um, SSMS, what you can't do is this. <laughs> you can't copy that message. You can't even select it. So it's not a huge deal, <clears throat> but if it's 2 a.m. and I've just fixed it, and I don't, I'd rather copy this message and paste it, send it in an email to somebody and say, this is what the failure was. You know what I mean? So anyway, by the way, that failure, um, that particular failure was by design. Um, but yeah, lots of lots of interesting stuff out here. And this is this is connected to SVA demo. It's actually looking at the um, catalog in the cloud that we're using. <clears throat> so back to this, I'm going to um, <clears throat> I'm going to deploy this. Actually, what I'm going to do is check it in. And when I check it in, um, the check in my code, I'm going to make a change and check it in. And the first time I do this, it's going to fail because I'm going to make it fail. But it's going to go through and start a pipeline. Uh, by default, that's going to deploy it to test and execute a test against it, and that test is going to fail. And if you remember, I told you that it's very important for me to, um, you know, to have this uh, stop the pipeline execution on a failure. Um, just uh, 60 seconds about the framework community edition. Uh, you can see if I execute a package inside of the SSIS catalog and SSMS, I can script uh, the execute package. And when you do that, you get a script that looks kind of like this. And um, I, I like this because I can put a wrapper around it like this. And that's exactly what I did. I created a schema um, named custom. And uh, inside of there, I added some stored procedures and tables. <clears throat> and um, this stored procedure allows me to call any package in any project in any folder um, uh, from just uh, by executing this stored proc. So that's handy because if you've ever tried to call inside of an SSIS project, execute a package using execute package task. If you wanted to execute a package in another <clears throat> project or folder or both, um, that doesn't show up in the list. So I've just kind of pulled all of my execute package tasks, replaced them with execute SQL tasks, and I call this stored proc and pass it these arguments. So I can run anything anywhere uh, that way. It's kind of handy for that reason if for no other. Again, if you go to DILM Suite, it's um, it'll take you over to Git, and it's uh, free and open source. Um, so while I'm in here, you know, if I add to my deploy to test, I can add these Azure PowerShell, um, you know, tasks here, and I, I'm going to run the SSIS package using a framework. And um, Excuse me. I'm going to run it using my, my framework. I've got that configured. And then I'm going to execute a test. It's a really dumb query. The uh, the test is looking, to, it's counting the number of records in a um, in a field. And, and you can see here, all I did was just uh, add the um, the Azure PowerShell. Um, and I, I, you know, added some PowerShell. I brought in uh, AZ. I set up my resource group and, um, you know, run my... Uh, I run a, um, a parent package uh, in here, and that starts the uh, that that starts this execution here. So you can see uh, my application name for the stored procedure that I'm calling is uh, gonna it, it's gonna pass in an application name of a uh, pass summit 2019 test, and then my uh, test is going to uh, select uh, the maximum date and then count the uh, number of rows from a table called test results. What's what's happening in my SSIS package, and I'll get to this in just a minute, is um, actually, let's, let's go look at it now so that I don't run off and leave you. The um, What I'm doing is I'm, I'm either truncating or not. That's the change I keep making. I'm either truncating my target table, call it, it's in a test schema dot results here. And, um, and then I'm writing a value and the value that I'm writing is um, into that table. And mind you, if I've truncated it, then this will be one row that it puts in. If I haven't, it'll be more than one. I insert into there the, um, the, um, the test value is the name I'm putting in. And then a question mark in OLEDB maps to a parameter. And the parameter is a, um, is a package variable. I'm just stuffing a, a value in there, whatever's in that package variable. So I'm either going to have one or more than one rows in there. Um, let's get that zoomed back out. 
and walk you through the the um, some more about this because to get it to trigger um, the pipeline when I check in, I have to do something called enable CI on um, on that on that pipeline name deploy to test and. What I'm going to do um, beyond this is I'm going to enable a couple of other triggers uh, before we're done so that we can walk it through that deploy to production and then test it in in production once it once it goes. Um, enabling the continuous integration is not hard on my uh, on my pipeline. I click on triggers and when I click on the uh, continuous integration part up here, I've get uh, enable continuous integration. Um, I can also do something called a gated check-in, a little beyond what we're talking about today. This We're just talking about getting it to fire when I check it in. But a lot of options here, uh, at least on the uh, TFS piece here. Um, beyond that, I can, um, you know, I pick, my, um, I pick my agent pool. And in this one, I'm showing you how I'm setting up the deployed to production. Um, I pick the pipeline and then... Down at the very bottom, there is a build completion option for this deploy to production. If I click that, and I'm going to in a minute, I have to enable this. Uh, the triggering build is the previous deploy to test. And what I'm telling this deploy to production uh, pipeline is if deploy to test uh, completes and succeeds, then go ahead and, and you start. You trigger based on that. And then the, the last one is a... Um, is, is actually the trigger from the check-in. I've got, I've kind of broke that into a couple of chunks and I'll show you the chunks. But if I make this one little change here, um, you will see um, how it works. And, and that's the very next demo. So the first thing I need to do is, um, hang on. First thing I need to do is enable those, uh, those triggers. So to do that, let's go, no, wrong thing here and back on my pipelines you can see them all once I click on this again and they're all listed there um, I'm going to use this version of deploy to test and uh, when I go into the editor which is right here I go to edit and then I go to trigger um, actually yeah if I go to pipeline I believe it is um, maybe it is triggers. Yep, there it is. Under triggers, enable continuous integration. So um, I just set everything up, told it to include the path in uh, SSIS samples. And that triggers this pipeline when I check in. Uh, for my next one, my next pipeline is the, um, the one number two here that deploys to production. And if I edit it and go to the triggers, um, again, it's a build completion. And I don't have this one configured, so I'm going to configure it when I click add. Um, it says um, which build, successful build, is going to trigger this, and it's going to be that one deployed to test. And once I do that, I can save it and ask me for a message. I'm just going to skip that. Um, th there's one more in here that actually runs it in production. It actually configures and, and deploys the framework metadata. And, and, and after it's done that, um, it executes it. So same sort of thing, triggering build, except this time I'm picking two deploy to production. So once these are saved and, and ready to go, um, I can trigger a, a build. And again, my, um, my build agent is running. It's setting up here, um, doing its thing. And what we're going to see is, if I want to put this down, yeah, let's get it out of the way a little bit. We'll see that it's going to inform me, uh, not on deploy to test, on this deploy to test. It's going to inform me first that uh, there's a new build. You'll see that pop up here. I got to trigger a change. The uh, change, I'm, the way I'm going to trigger it is, um, actually, I don't. My check-in is ready. So this is going to assert a, uh, a failure because not truncating that table first is going to make two records. It's going to end up with more than one record in there. And that's my test. It's a contrived test. But I'm not trying to show you how to test SSIS packages. Oops, okay. All of those changes. Let's do that. Let's try it now. I'm trying to show you these cool pipelines. Um, so, <laughs> you're not authorized. Okay, here we go. <laughs> let's see. 
see if it's doing anything. It isn't doing anything because I'm not authorized to do it. And this happens to me when I have more than one workspace on here and I have like four. Um, so how do, the way that I fix this particular one is I need to go make sure that I'm connected to the um, to the right project. Um, often, uh, well, I'm kind of glad you're seeing us because I, if I uh, go to manage connections, um, this is what I'm trying to, to uh, connect to, and I'm going to tell it to connect to a project, and it's looking at the wrong account. That is so odd because it was looking at the right account about an hour ago. <laughs> I ran through this. Uh, there's SSI samples, connect to that. And if I go look at my pending changes now, oh, it closed my project. That's okay. We can open the project. And yeah, so now we have a pending change. If I, um, if I view Team Explorer, yeah, hush. Uh, it's a search failure and then check in. What are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Cannot access disposed project. All right. Sorry. One more time. <clears throat> Something happened that triggered it to connect to a different repository. And I may have to restart my build agent as well. Let's see if it likes me now. Okay. It looks like it likes me now. There's my C1 new build. Um, we see that it is um, running the job deploy to test. And if I uh, if I click on my, my um, let's go back here. Yeah, there's my new build. If I click on that, the one named assert failure, we'll see that it's run through a couple of the initial stuff that it does. And it's now uh, trying to deploy. And again, this is going to deploy over the version in the uh, in the one folder there, the original folder, it's going to execute the test suite. And by the way, the test looks something like this, and it's going to fail because there are two records in there. And it's testing; uh, it only returns a success if there's one record in there. So we're going to see this fail, but that's by design. I, I even typed a cert failure into the name when it executes the uh, test suite. Right now, it's finishing the deployment, and um, once that's done. It'll execute this test suite and fail, and we will see it. It'll tell us in the um, uh, right here in the object. Move this up a little bit. There it is running the test. It's using PowerShell to execute a query. And we're going to see this come back as failed. I think. <laughs> That's my goal. It's weird when you want it to fail, right? Um, and there it is. It did. It did, in fact, fail. And down here we see a failed uh, error message, and that's a custom message. Two records found at 12:04:23:55. <clears throat> did exactly what I wanted it to do. If I go back and look at my pipelines, I'll see nothing else is running. Um, I can click through these other two. There's nothing running there. There's nothing running there. This is the original one that I triggered manually a little while ago, and this one failed. So let's uh, let's have a successful run. And enabling this truncate target will set it to zero rows first, and then uh, it'll insert that one row. And so we will have one row once this is done. And we should see um, a pass when that happens. So back to my builds, and there's my C1 new build. It's running now. Uh, we can look at the agent here. <clears throat> uh, it started again after the failure. It started running this deploy to test. Uh, back here, it's deploying SSIS. <clears throat> I note that um, still over here in, um, you know, inside of um, Catalog Browser, inside the catalog itself, we still don't have anything deployed to production. That hasn't happened yet, uh, but it's it's where it's coming. So we're running deploy to test still. Um, in the background, we are running that, and we're going to run the test. That'll be next.
And I can't explain why I'm fascinated by this, but I like watching these little console windows. <laughs> I just do. <clears throat> Hopefully this one will succeed. That was the goal. If we go run our test manually, we're still seeing two test rows. Oh, it's going to fail again. And it did. <clears throat> okay. Well, hang on. One more time. Okay. Let's do one more. Um, there. So we'll try that one more time. And that hasn't executed yet. Um, let's go to our build. And I noticed that earlier, uh, when I ran through this earlier, for some reason, uh, half the time it wasn't doing the truncate. Not sure why. Um, but this version definitely has it enabled, and it is checked in. Uh, we're running that package. We should have one row eventually. <clears throat> There's our uh, execution. Weird. All right. Okay, now it's running the test. And it didn't insert any rows. It's going to be one of those demos, folks. Sorry about that. <clears throat> not sure why it's not doing that. It is not. And it should fail if it does not equal one, and it's not going to equal one. So I am, I am at a loss. The only thing I can think of ah, that's what it is. That's why neither worked. Okay. My wife comes to hear me uh, present about once a year, and she says, no one likes to watch you troubleshoot, Andy. <clears throat> I apologize for that. I forgot that I was deleting it, and I was not reapplying the password. <clears throat> if nothing else, you know that it doesn't work the first time for anyone. It's talking to the uh, to the database, and for the connection manager, it needed the password to do that, and it didn't have it. Live demos. And I typed in them. No one tell Buck Woody. There's my one record. Woohoo! Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and that's why the truncate wasn't working either. It wasn't connecting using the same connection manager. So this should succeed. <clears throat> and um, and when it does, if we pop back over to pipelines. And look at number two here. We should see a, in a minute, we should see an additional execution popping up here. I think. There we go. One new build. That build has been triggered. <clears throat> so if we watch this go, it's looking for my agent. It found it. And here it is running deploy to prod. And it is deploying the um, the SSIS package. It should have done it. If I refresh this, we should see a, a plus show up here. <clears throat> I 
and it does, and it's deployed it um, out there to uh, production. And now it's trying to do this third piece. And if we go look at that, we can watch it run, and we should see production framework. <clears throat> it's um, putting in some metadata, and it's going to attempt to execute it after that. But the goal of my demo was to show you that I can daisy chain these pipeline executions uh, off of based off of a check in, and I checked it in, it deployed it to test, it tested it, it, did, it executed it, and then it, it ran a uh, it ran a test, albeit very contrived and really simple, but it ran that in uh, PowerShell. If that test failed, which we saw numerous times, the pipeline stopped dead in its tracks. But if it succeeded. It then continued to deploy to the next layer, which here's my production layer. Um, and, and after that, there's some post stuff, some metadata that I'm putting in for execution and production. And I would break it up like this in general. Um, would I be so bold as to um, as to put this, uh, have it deploy to production like this, <clears throat> and um, you know, and actually run to CI/CD? I will say my goal would be to eventually get there. Um, you know, would it be? Um, and one of them is still running. Actually, my uh, my parent package in the framework is actually still executing. You can see the uh, status there. Uh, eventually, yeah, I'd like to get there. I'd like to get a, enough confidence in my DevOps process where I could run it through. It wouldn't be just one test, and it wouldn't be one test in one environment, but where I could do code promotion based on successful um, testing in lower tiers of my application or of my life cycle. So, um, but it, it did uh, what I wanted it to do uh, here. It, it ran and uh, everything triggered. It worked like I wanted it to. And if I go look at this list here, I can see um, they, it always shows me the last thing first. And uh, for this one, I labeled go. That was my check-in message. Um, um, then, then it, it, it succeeded in, uh, there it is, it succeeded in its execution of this pipeline. That triggered the deploy to production pipeline. That succeeded, and that triggered the deploy framework metadata, which uh, also ran and succeeded, and it did a bunch of steps. Um, it cleaned up after itself. It deployed new, a fresh set of pr uh, framework metadata, executed the uh, the production package in, in, um, in the framework, and and that all of that succeeded. So what I was after, kind of my dream from all the way back in 2007 uh, with SSIS, uh, I can now do this. I can do DevOps with, uh, with SSIS. So um, let's see. That's all I have. A few final thoughts. Uh, it's always an honor to, to present. Um, you can learn more about me at um, andyleonard.blog slash learn dash more. And if I can uh, help you in any way, um, reach out. Uh, my email address is andy.leonard at entdna.com. So, thanks. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of this. I kind of rolled through it because it's a lot of material and it's a chilly evening in Milwaukee. Uh, <laughs> uh, any any questions or uh, any thoughts? Anything you'd like to share? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really good question. I kind of. I touched on the briefly on the answer, um, which is, um, you know, I, I this is um, I made this as simple as I could to show off the SSIS build and deploy uh, task. But absolutely, you would do this way differently in a production DevOps environment. You would um, you would take advantage of test plans. Um, you would not just run build pipelines. You would do releases. Um, you would use uh, artifacts. I didn't touch artifacts in here. There's a number of pieces of Azure DevOps I didn't even I didn't even touch in this particular one. But yeah, that's that's a fair criticism. Um, 
but uh uh, I, 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 you know, I mentioned it kind of, I just barely touched on it a little bit that this is, I'm leaving a lot of stuff out and I'm simplifying the, uh, the just, I, I just wanted to dip my toe in pipelines and show you uh, that I could do what I, what I showed, but you're, you're right. And, and it, to really, to really build this out, um, you know, one of the, one of the other pieces to this, that is, it's hard to understand until you do it. Um, if your organization is not practicing any life cycle at all, which I I don't see that anymore. Everybody's doing something. Um, the small shops that have a single person in it, even them, a lot of them are doing, you know, documenting processes and coming, you know, at least coming to, with some kind of uh, um, life cycle tiers like dev, test, and prod. Um, and, uh, you know, those are those are kind of the people on the edge where you're wearing four hats or something. But if you're doing anything um, like this with DevOps, and if you're a, a larger shop, you don't have to be big. You can have you know a handful of people, two, three, four, five people on a team um, working in the data team, and you try to introduce DevOps in it. That is a culture shift, and that usually ends up being the biggest part of um, uh, of the change. Is it's not the tech. The tech's not that hard. Um, it's it's how you think um, and and you know what do you do to uh, especially when the chips are down something goes wrong in production and, and DevOps isn't going to um, I, I was going to say it wasn't going to work for everyone but it can it can work for for everyone um, it, you know if if you're willing to invest in the culture shift and that's not easy. That is a hard thing to do. It's hard for me. It's hard for everybody. Um, one of the reasons that I presented this in the way that I did, that I stayed so light on the pipelines and, and really on the DevOps part, is I don't want to run anybody off, not in you know 75 minutes. Uh, I want to encourage you to at least go, if you go this far, this is my thinking. And the reason I'm bringing this up is as part of the answer to your question, is if, if I can get you this far, then I believe you you know you have a better than um, better than not chance of taking it to the rest of the levels. So that that's my logic. I, I may be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and by the way, if um, if DevOps is a new word for you, or you've heard the word, you're not really you're not really into it that much. Um, Gene Kim is an author that wrote a book called The Phoenix Project um, years ago. It's a it's a fantastic book. Uh, you'll see yourself in it uh, no matter where, you know, someplace in there, you'll find yourself beginning or the end, hopefully at the end. Um, but uh, when I first read it, I was at the beginning. Um, and that book is actually based off a, a book by a gentleman named Goldratt that was um, written in the early or mid 80s, I think. It's called The Goal, and it's all about manufacturing processes. Um, I actually was doing manufacturing back in the 80s and 90s, and um, I read that book as part of a, a course that um, that we that the the factory I worked for. It was a Stanley Hardware plant. They actually sponsored. Um, instructor, instructors to come in from a local community college and teach us a dozen courses. And that was one of them was on manufacturing processes. And they paid us to attend. And we got a certificate at the end. It was really, you know, that's that's one of the kind of devops -y ways of doing things, right? You invest in people. And we all want that. Um, the Phoenix Project is worth a read. There's a new one out that I downloaded. I just got it um and I think it just came out. I want to say it hasn't been out long this year. It's called the Unicorn Project. It's by Gene Kim and some some DevOps people. Um, and and he you know he's written they've written a lot of books about that. They've got some books that are more dry, I should say, than that. But the stories, telling the stories, is the best way to present this. And that's one of the reasons I I built this demo the way it was. I was inspired by by uh, Kim's um, storytelling. Um, so there's a there's a lot in this. I, I'm not not you know not going to lie about it. And if you go to if you do data engineering or data integration in Microsoft Space these days, 
If you go over to Azure Data Factory, right there on the on the front screen is you know connect to a, a a Git repository. In fact, I'll bring up. I've still got that open. Um, I logged into the portal so that I could start my. Um, I logged into the portal. I hit, I hit uh, a demo. That's my data factory. I hit author and monitor, and it took me over here. And I did that so I could start, you know, my integration runtimes. I'm using this one. That's the integration runtime we're using tonight. Um, I don't think it tells me here, but it will tell me. Maybe there, if I click on it. No, that's not the spot. There's another spot. It's in monitor. If I go to monitor and integration runtimes, um, they've got a little dashboard for it. And um, there's the dashboard and there's SVA demo. <laughs> so that's what we've been looking at all night um, is the SVA demo one. And um, I don't think I refreshed. Uh, the connection to browser. Yeah, I did. Okay, the connection to browser shows me that. But yeah, this is. It, but if you go back to um, the dashboard part of this, right here is um, is set up a code repository, and there's now six of these little um, circles up here. Um, the sixth one showed up right before pass, and it, before that it was five, and I want to say it was at one point it was like three. Uh, one here, and it was um, uh, create a pipeline, uh, copy data, and set up code repository. And then they added configure an SSIS integration runtime, and then create pipeline. And now you can do create data flows. That's the new one. Um, configure integ SSIS integration. But right here at the top, one of the first three of these icons was set up a code repository. And when you do this, it allows you to hook into Azure DevOps. Um, I'm not. I haven't clicked it in a long time. It used to allow you to go to GitHub.com and set up there. And they are serious about this lifecycle management DevOps thing. They're building it in. They're as serious about this nowadays as they were about um, security. You know, uh, 15, 18 years ago after SQL Slammer hit, they kind of ramped down and everybody went through training on security and they ramped back up. And security stopped being this thing that you did in the middle of a project or even worse at the end where you kind of bolted it on and shoehorned it in and it became the thing you did first. And now you set up a code repository first and then you do security. <laughs> you know, that's that's how they're thinking right now about this. And um, it's good. The, the, the reason you go through the pain of learning this and it's not without pain. The reason you want to do this is because later you want to be able to have the confidence that your code is going to deploy to production and 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 it's just going to work. You go, you want to know that before you push the button. And, and and you don't even want to have to push the button. You just want to check in the code in your QA tier and have or UAT and have it do what I just did here, something like this. You want to have it do it, run test plans. You want to have artifacts created, but you're going to still be running something if you're doing SSIS. You're still going to be running something like that build and deploy SSIS piece. So um, hopefully that over answers your question. Sorry, I talk too much. OK. Right, so I, I heard bits and pieces, and it's not your fault, um, but let me repeat back what I thought I heard. Um, is, is the question mostly about comparing SSIS package contents? Okay, yeah, that's notoriously hard, and that's not SSIS's fault. Um, here's why it's hard. If I uh, click on this package we've been running and press uh, F7, uh, this is the code, and it's XML, right? So the, the way XML works is 
as long as it's you know it's at the same level as long as the hierarchy is the same then you know the the code is the same if you're talking about comparisons but this it, you can move things around like right here i've got a uh, you know i've got a connection manager dts connection manager and its parent is the dts executable well what if i cut this and move it down to the bottom you know uh, of the you know, all of my connection manager if i cut this and move it down to the bottom of this it would still be logically the same code and it would still work the same but if i tried to compare it on a text level i can't because i have to find a way first to semantically rationalize this weird thing about xml where it doesn't matter positionally where the code is and if you think about what it's like in c sharp um, for instance the position of that code is the execution order of that code. That's not true here. So because of that, I first have to come up with a way to re-represent this package, these, these components of a package. And I call that semantic rationalization. I have to come up with a way to, to rationalize this and then make sure that it's always compared that way. And then and only then can I determine that, yep, this package matches that. You, you end up with a lot of false negatives. Uh, when you do that. And as even deploying this package to the SSI's catalog um, can impact uh, can impact the uh, the XML. Hope that answers your question. All right, sorry, I wasn't able to catch all of that. <laughs> you you can have somebody look at it physically. Yeah, you, you can definitely do pull requests and uh, you know in, in using um, uh, Git, and you can do the stuff. Everything that I showed you here in TFS, you can do with Git. Um, there's, there's, it, it's different because Git workflow is different. But Azure DevOps supports the Git workflow, and you can do it that way. And you can have somebody physically look at it and tell you, and you can have somebody run a text compare uh, against the code. Yes. Right. So if it compiles, yes, it will do that. You're absolutely right. And you and I are in agreement. Um, this is uh, this is a hard problem to to solve, and it's it's a it's an important step. Com comparing code, um, you know, and, and this is something that we can't do yet in SSIS. That's a step we can't do in DevOps right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I, that's a good question. Let me make sure I understood you. Um, like if I have a solution here called Test SSIS Solution, or if I renamed it Test Solution. And I had a test SSIS project in here and an SSRS project in here and analysis services in here. Yeah, there's no issue with that, um, you know, in here. Yep. So um, as far as with SSIS projects, um, I don't branch them for because of the the comparison reason, um, and and not not just the comparison reason. That's a, that's the wrong way to say it. Um, it is impossible to merge SSIS XML. 
So, you know, why branch it if I'm not going to end up merging it later? It's it's effectively for me a, um, a and I do so I do use branches in Git, but I do it as a way of um, more of labeling than of you know branching with the idea of merging. I'm I'm just going to take what's in the uh, branch at the end of the day, and I'm going to push that over to master, um, and. and that's going to, you know, that's going to replace master in an SSIS project. And it's all because of that XML. If I, if I can't compare, I can't effectively merge and I can't, it's a known issue. Um, I'm not making it up. Uh, we ran into it in the early days, um, back then 2006, I tried it. it. It was broken. I couldn't get it to work. And I thought my first thought is whenever I can't get something to work is I'm doing something dumb. Um, but I had worked on a book, uh, one of the first uh, SSIS books that came out in early 2006, uh, the Rocks book. And I had written a chapter in there about using TFS for source control. I'm not sure, but I may have actually published the first thing on TFS um, back then. That's how long this dream has been, because I, I was an MCSD back in the days before .NET. <clears throat> so I jumped the fence into data. Um, back in the early 2000s. Um, and I was doing test-driven development. When I, I was first introduced to it as fail-first development, and I thought, this is awesome because I fail first every single time. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this forever. But I was doing VB uh, at the time, VB6. I'd started in VB2 and worked my way up to VB6. I was doing um, ASP before the X. Um, and, you know, I was... Uh, early adopter of a tool called Visual Interdev, which kind of got rolled into Visual Studio as, um, you know, as, as ASPX development. Um, so I was familiar with source control and the whole idea of lifecycle management. And my background is engineering. So testing is just a thing. You know, that's what we do. And, you know, when SSIS came along, I tried it with that. Because I'd written that chapter, I I knew the people inside of Microsoft who were building TFS uh, when it, the first version came out. And I communicated with them and said, hey, why can't I do this? And they said, oh, yeah, that's not you. <laughs> so, and, and they said, it's kind of not us. But it, it has to do with the fact that in most languages, <coughs> pardon me, the uh, order of the code is um, is deterministic. And in XML, it's not. You can move things around and it still be the same code. So how do you compare that? Well, you, you, you're missing a step. First, you have to do this extra step that you don't have to do in VB or C Sharp or ASPX. And, and that's the problem. It's the, you know, and it's um, any, any code that is not positionally deterministic. JSON has the same problem. Any code that you can move a line, you swap this line with that line, lines three and four, and it still does the same thing. That's, you know, good luck comparing that. You've got to inject a layer into the comparison. You have to say, you have to kind of build an object um, or at least impose some co some kind of order um, at the, um, you know, at the node level. So, or at least the sub node levels. And if you inject that, that order, then yes, you SSIS, JSON, XML. But... Um, Um, I have not yet tried to merge an ADF um, branch. That's a good question. It is JSON. Um, I wonder if it's uh, deterministic enough, or if they've built um, if they built enough into it to where they can manage. They're somehow managing that. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I promise I haven't done it yet. But it's a really good question. Good enough. I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that. Oh, thank you all. I appreciate y'all coming out. Uh, and I appreciate the people that joined us online. And if you're watching this, uh, watching the recording, um, again, you can uh, you can ping me 
here at uh, um, at uh, Andy.Leonard at ENTDNA.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If I don't know the answer, I probably know someone who does. So thank you all for having me. This was awesome. Y'all too.